Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. I am delighted to be joined by Mr. Martin O'Neill. I was going to do a rundown of all the clubs that you've played for and managed, but I'm sure we'll go through them as time goes on. But uh, I suppose, Martin, just how are you and, uh, and what kind of what's day to day life for you like for you nowadays uh, at the moment? I'm really fine. First of all, Paul, so thank you for asking. I'm fine. I've been uh, um, well. I've been busy in the last few months, uh, actually, uh, penning the book, writing the book. And then I've just followed up by some things that the publishers have asked me to do. And uh, I've been doing that there. It's, it's, be, it's been fine. Um, certainly in the run up to Christmas time, it was it was pretty strong. So I'm, yeah, happy enough to do that there. And I do some uh, overseas punditry work as well, too. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah I, keep, uh, I keep pretty busy. Yeah, I, I just I was going through and doing a little bit of research on you earlier. And uh, something that probably... I wouldn't say too many people know about you, but you've kind of like a fascination with criminology. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, funnily enough, I do have. You know, some, sometimes people might think that's a rather morbid subject to be talking about. But, uh, yeah, I think um, probably stemmed really from um, there was a crime of passion committed uh, in our village, the village that I was uh, born and grew up in, Kilray in County Derry. Um, a crime of passion there when I must have been about seven or eight years of age. And... My father came home, told us about the story, and uh, obviously it garnered a great deal of interest locally at the time. As you know, crimes of passion weren't um, uh, weren't um, uh, well, they, they they weren't the main uh, topic of conversation at, at, at that stage. Um, but it just seemed rather strange in a little village that very very a little happened in, and um, and I just I, I think I've been fascinated from from then on in. And of course, I think when I was about. 10 or 11 years, 10 years of age, um, very, very famous case in, in England, uh, um, a man of, uh, of Irish origin, James Hanratty, was hanged for a murder uh, here that he claimed right until, um, until he was hanged that he didn't commit. And that became a, a fascinating subject for me in, in, um, when I came to England. And uh, so, yes, it... Uh, it has kept, it's been there ever since, you know, I would go into uh, some courtrooms and uh, just sit down during the afternoon of, of, uh, of events and, uh, and uh, have a little look to see, see what was happening. But it was, uh, yeah, but that, that interest has, has been maintained for quite some considerable time. But I can't say that I'm entering courtrooms now on a regular basis at, at, at my age. Yeah, no, it's because I, I just saw there was the, the trials of Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe and Donald Nielsen, better known as the, the Black Panther, the serial killer. So I think you you attended the trial there for that one as well. I, I yes, I, I did. Yeah, I, I, I must admit. But uh, I think that, um, uh, yes, the one was uh, uh, the Black Panther was uh, tried in Oxford Crown Court in 1976. And of course, um so this is while you were playing then, yeah? I would have been, yeah, absolutely. I'd have been a player at the time, but it happened during the, the trial took place in the summertime. So that wasn't a, wasn't a major problem. And uh, also the trial of the Yorkshire Ripper took place um, around about the time that we would have been, we, Northern Ireland, would have been playing some home international matches at that stage. So again, there was an opportunity before we met up one particular day to uh, to attend the trial. Okay, I see. And uh, it's just as well. Uh, I just read as well that you like to attend. Are you love attending murder mystery weekends? Do you still do that, or was that just kind of no, weird? no, no? I've I've not. I've never really done that. I di I didn't know. I didn't. I did. Um, uh, I was asked a way back. There's. Uh, you you probably would remember the 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 infamous uh, Jack the Ripper a way back. You know, about a hundred and twenty, hundred and twenty five years ago. I think I around. saw the documentary on uh, Netflix. I think I saw yeah. it. Yeah, and uh, and it was only that uh, um, someone sent me an invitation. Would I would I fancy going along to one of the evenings where obviously someone there would be a, a tour guide who would take you around the particular spots. Of course, life in uh, in that part of London has changed um, uh, drastically since then. But uh, so that was that was kind of interesting. The very fact is that uh, no one ever knew who. Uh, who, who committed the murders either. There was a lot of speculation about a number of uh, different people at the time. But of course, we're going back um, a, a, a big, a long time ago, let me put it this way, Paul. So 
But uh, no, other other those sort of invitations you talk about murder weekends or something like this here. No, I've never attended any of those. Okay, well maybe it was it was wrong, but that's I was just doing a bit of research earlier, and I was speaking with a friend of mine, a close friend, and he said I should ask you about it because it is quite interesting because you wouldn't really, you know renown a, a an international and a premier league manager as, as someone who would attend kind of these courts listening to that especially as a player as well at the time yeah i did yeah i was i, I mean i'd always had an interest in and in at times that we had a an opportunity um in in afternoons particularly when i was a player they down down maybe at uh, nottingham crown court you could go to some some things and you just could go in and uh and listen to the listen to the barristers as much as anything else. But um, I know so. Uh, but those those cases uh, that I I went to uh, didn't uh, garner much interest because they were uh, they were kind of like ten a penny in those days. I see. I see. Well, look, we have you on to talk football. So I suppose from a football standpoint, you're growing up in Killary. You know, starting uh, starting out playing football, and you were a GAA player as well. But what was life like growing up as a Catholic then? Because there was a lot of troubles and stuff like that. Um, was GAA frowned upon back then? Uh, no, no. I I grew up. Uh, yeah, you you mentioned uh, strangely enough. I grew up in the um in, in the fifties, where sporadic sporadic um um sporadic trouble was. I think as mainly. Um, mainly around the border towns, uh, things like this here. And of course, I'm not so sure that Belfast ever, never didn't have trouble in, in that in that sense. But uh, it seemed more sporadic in the 50s. And um, no, our neighbours, uh, I had Protestant neighbours that I got on, I got on very very well with. My family got on very well with, and there was never really a, a, a genuine problem at all. The um, the problems uh, eventually started, I think, with civil rights march in nineteen uh, in January of nineteen sixty nine, and of course, then we had thirty years of troubles. By which time in nineteen sixty nine, I was uh, my family had moved up to Belfast. So yes, we were able to we did experience, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, obviously a lot of, a lot of trouble at that time, and uh, by nineteen seventy one. Uh, by late 1971, I had become a professional player at Nottingham Forest. So, talking really from 69 to 71, uh, in those days, yes, it was. Um, it was, I think, families who have been left bereaved uh, would have find um, would have found these difficult days to to comprehend. Never mind anything else. So, um, but no, in terms of in terms of me growing up and my early childhood. It was never really a problem. Um, my father was helped found at the GAA club here in in Kilray, and uh, but he was a barber in the in the village, and he had as uh, he had as many Protestant clients as he did have Catholics. In, in fact, um, in on in his window he had a very very famous red picture. Well, almost. It's almost like a discolored picture, but it, it wasn't really. It was just a really brilliant picture, rather big of uh, or a photograph of uh, the Busby Babes, the Manchester United team. Some of some of the players who were killed in the air crash in um, in 1958. So he had that on, uh, adorned in his uh, the window of his shop. So I don't think that um, I think that um, as I said to you at the time, I think that we had a lot of Protestant friends. And uh, in those those years, from um, from uh, mid fifties certainly onto mid sixties, um, the town didn't uh, didn't experience too much trouble at all. Okay, well, just on your own self, did you find it hard to navigate away from GAA because your dad was involved to then go into say I'm going to call it soccer right? Okay, in this case. well, yeah, uh, that's a good point. I loved the GAA. Absolutely loved it. I loved playing Gaelic football. Uh, my older brothers played for uh, not only for Kilray, the the town, uh, but also for Derry, uh, County Derry. My uh, older brother played in an All Ireland final on the way back in 1958 that my mother took me to, and uh, of course Gaelic was uh, very very strong in in our family, and um, of course I I grew up. Not not just playing there, playing college football, 
as well to and playing for Derry Miners in, at, at, at Crow Park. So yeah, I absolutely loved it. Um, I was um, I was uh, a pretty decent player as well too, and pretty decent at soccer. And I suppose the opportunity to do something that you would love doing and, and uh, becoming a professional footballer in England is probably really what I wanted to do. But uh, yeah, the, in terms of Gaelic, absolutely loved it. Yeah, because it, it seems to be a case. I know Seamus Coleman, who you later kind of went on to manage and stuff like that. He was a, a huge GAA uh, player and, and he loved it as well. He comes back to play at any time he can as well. Were you ever like that when you came back, maybe from a holiday or anything, you, you'd, you'd get involved with the GAA? I, I, yeah, I, I, to to um, I, I think to my dismay once because believe it or not, I did actually one one particular summertime. I was I was moving to uh, from Norwich to Manchester City as a player. I I had not done any training for about a week or ten days or something like this year. The move was going going through, but I was on holiday back home in Kilray. I was joining up with some uh, some of my old uh, ex uh, school pals playing a game of Gaelic, and you wouldn't believe this ball. I actually pulled my calf muscle. Here were, here were the other lads who would probably be heading down to the pub just after the game was over, and I was supposed to be the athlete among them, and I was the one that pulled a calf muscle. <laughs> and that really, it, not only was it irritating, it actually it curtailed um, early, early uh, training sessions with Manchester City. And, um, and I... I I spent weeks. I tried to come back early to do the pre-season work, and uh, and the calf muscle never really uh, did never really healed itself for what should have been a probably a three-week injury. Probably continued for for the best part of seven or eight weeks. So from that viewpoint, yes, I I wish I'd not joined in that particular day anyway. But uh, um, a lesson to be learned, I suppose. Yeah. Um... <laughs> It's it's amazing what you could have got away with back then, you know. Uh, you hear so many stories of players coming back and just like that, where where they go and they like Kevin Moore and playing GAA and playing for Manchester United as well. You know, you hear so many uh, stories back then of, and you could get away with it back then because there wasn't the social media and stuff like that because you could go in and play a game, but it was kept under wraps. You know, that's absolutely right. Yes, uh, even to the point, you know, where we had. Um... Uh, even way back those days, we had uh, uh, things written into your contract that you weren't allowed to, instance, for you didn't weren't allowed to ski, and quite rightly so, absolutely. But they didn't write in that you uh, that you couldn't uh, you couldn't spend your holidays on motorbikes. They hadn't written that in. And uh, I remember myself, John Robertson, and Tony Woodcock, two of my colleagues at Nottingham Forest, um, we were on holiday together, and uh, we were. Um, uh, we were get got on these particular motorbikes, you know, like almost like motocross, traveling but and getting up to ridiculous speeds and falling off them as well too. And uh, I honestly, I think that if uh, I think if Brian Clough had seen us at that time, the manager, I think he would have uh, gone ballistic. But uh, anyway, so as you say, with social media these days, I don't think players could get up to that, you know. Yeah, well, talk to me about um, you know, the your time at Distillery, which then obviously led to Nottingham Forest. I mean, you scored against Barcelona, um, in Belfast in the three one loss, um, and obviously then that was the two legged fight. That was the Cup Winners Cup back then, and then mm -hmm. um, and then going, I suppose, to to Forest after winning the the Cup against Derry City. Yeah, did you feel a little bit bad? Maybe beating Derry City, considering you're a Derry man. <laughs> well, isn't it interesting? I had um, uh, two two players at Derry City um, that I played against that particular day and scored against were two of my school pals when I was uh, boarder at St Columns in Derry, and uh, two of them, um, uh, Raymond White and Declan McDowell, played. Raymond eventually came up when he went to Queen's University. He ended up joining me at Distillery for a little while as well, too. But yeah, and it was really strange to actually play against two of your school pals that I had uh, I had shared Gaelic games with as well a, a few years earlier. So that was absolutely strange. And of course, um, at, Derry, at Derry City, I used to watch from um, from the hillside a great deal. Um, Derry, Derry had a very fine side in the in the 60s. They won the Irish Cup, uh, I think it was about 1964, 65. And that meant that they played in European football. 
And of course, my the school that I was at, the um, uh, was St. Columns in Derry, and a very particular height. And um, and when the lights were on for those games, we were able to watch from from a distance. I must admit, you couldn't necessarily recognise any, any every single player, but from a distance, and that was. Uh, that was an amazing scene to look to look down on Derry City actually playing European football, and we could see the whole of the pitch from 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 where we stood. When I say we stood, I'm talking about a a group of us who were really interested in Derry City at the time. So that was that was uh, remarkably strange. Yeah, but then you go from from watching Derry play in Europe, and then and you you go and play against Barcelona yourself, and you think you're getting the score sheet. I just think that's amazing. Um, yeah, it, you know, we'd we'd won the Irish Cup. I'd scored the two goals, particularly against my school pals, and that was the. I uh, believe the set one of the goals was was unbelievable, amazing run. It was. I, I must admit, yeah, it's, <laughs> I I believe it or not, I did have talent for both Gaelic and soccer, a really good talent. So I shouldn't I shouldn't be too self effacing in this matter. You know, I I um, Gaelic I absolutely loved and uh, and was really good at it. But anyway, getting back to the um, getting back to the soccer game. Scored against Bar, uh, sorry, scored one of the goals you used to talk about. Maisie run against uh, against Derry City in the final. Uh, we win, we won by three goals. I've scored twice in the game, and of course, as you mentioned earlier, that gets you into the European Cup Winners Cup. We're drawn against Barcelona. I score then, and even though I probably in in my book I don't make a big fuss of it, that that game and that goal probably brought me into. What I would term the uh, the British um, uh, um, what shall I limelight at least for a second or two. So in, in other words, what I'm saying is that uh, Barcelona, even though they beat us three one in the in the home or our home game, it gave me a little bit of traction. So much so that I feel that um, within a week or two of that game, we um, Northern Ireland were playing an international match at home against Russia. Some of the players, uh, for one reason or another, uh, English based players couldn't make it. And the player manager at the time, Terry Neal, who was also player manager of Hull City, he, uh, instead of bringing some other English based players over, he decided to take the risk with me. And I joined up with the Irish squad. And in fact, a couple of days later, he actually made a bid for me of £10,000. And that was topped by Nottingham Forest for £15,000. So within a week of uh, being involved with the Northern Irish squad, and I'm talking about, you know, the likes of uh, uh, Pat Rice, Sammy Nelson, uh, uh, Pat Jennings, of course, uh, really, really fine players. Then there I am a week later, instead of being um, an amateur football, an amateur footballer for a distillery, suddenly I'm thrust in as a professional player literally overnight um, to to join a, a struggling Nottingham Forest team. Nevertheless, it didn't matter to me that they were struggling. I was now a professional footballer. Yeah, like it, it's a lot of time in football. It's timing and luck, as they say. And clearly in that scenario, although you were clearly good enough, hmm. you know, but you got the timing and the luck there between the call up and then obviously, you know, you'd, you'd done the business on the pitch in terms of you scored the goals in, in the cup hmm. and then you'd scored the goal against Barcelona, which I'm sure would have given you some sort of uh, personal limelight as well as obviously the fact hmm. that people would have been coming to see Barcelona play in Belfast. Yes, I, I, I take your point entirely. I think eventually I probably would have... Uh, I, I probably would have uh, been transferred across to England anyway because I, I think it was good enough. But that definitely that propelled it. That certainly uh, instead of instead of maybe going on the following March, for instance, there I was in the last week of October, be, uh, joining Nottingham Forest in, uh, in 1971. So I take your point entirely. You need a little bit of luck somewhere along the way. And it happened. And I, I've been thankful to Terry Neal. Unfortunately, he just passed away there a few months ago, and I did go down to his funeral. But he uh, he was the one that really uh, gave me that particular opportunity. But of course, the person I probably owe most to uh, would be um, the manager of Distillery, who was a, a brilliant, brilliant manager called Jimmy Michael Linden. And he, he was the one that uh, gave me that self-belief because when I did play a couple of reserve games for Distillery, I didn't play too well in them. Yet he thrust me straight into the first team, 
I scored against Portadown in my debut and really never looked back after that. So he was the one that gave me that belief when it might have started to wane. And I'm starting to think to myself, if I can't play too well for uh, for um, distillery reserves, I wonder where all of this is going to. But he was the one, as I say, that thrust me into the first team and uh, and I never really looked back until I was transferred. Yeah, well, you spent not five years at Nottingham Forest. So talk to me about those years and like... It's actually like unheard of the stuff that you've accomplished during that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually came in seventy. I, I was there for ten years, almost ten years. At oh, the sorry. Football. No, no problem. The last five years were 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 pretty exceptional, really, in the sense that uh, my my when I got there, first of all, uh, Nottingham Forest were struggling. They had some really really fine players in their in their team, but as a team, the club was struggling which was a real shame because a couple of years earlier, uh, in 19, uh, in 1966-67, which was only about four or five years previously, they had finished runners-up in, the, um, in the league and got to the semi-final of the FA Cup. Now, in those days, the FA Cup was considered, a, 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 and still should be, considered a major trophy, but it had so much luster attached to it at that time. So, but the club had been on the wane since then, you know, and... and um, and really, it was a struggle. They were selling their best players. Uh, Ian Story Moore left at that, that particular year, the year that I came, and the team was uh, the team was uh, relegated. But I'd scored a couple of goals. I'd made a little bit of an impact, and um, but it was it was definitely a couple of years of of real struggle, real struggles, struggle to a struggle to make a real proper impression. Sometimes it was going really strongly for a couple of months. And then suddenly you would drop back again. I'm talking about personally, and um, these fights for you know these fights to be uh, to to get a claim really to um, and obviously the the club wasn't improving that much either until Brian Clough arrived. When he arrived, things the things uh, changed. Didn't change immediately. Uh, his um, his assistant manager Peter Taylor. That when the two of them came together again after. Uh, a number of months apart, then um, then it really did happen. And then we went on this phenomenal journey for a couple of years, leading to promotion, leading to winning the league, which would be called the Premier League now, and uh, a couple of European Cups, a couple of League Cups. And it was just like a, it was like a roller coaster ride that you were never really getting off. And we went from strength to strength, from success to success. And it was incredible, Paul. So the last number of years were were something that you that really, really difficult to uh, to imagine. Sometimes you do have to pinch yourself now to think: Did this did this actually happen? Some uh, some time ago, um, there was a documentary done about it called um, uh, "What Was It?" I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. Well done, Paul. And I watched really, it. Was, what I watched it. Yeah, it was very good. So. And even when we were doing it and looking back on it, you think to yourself, well, you know, did this happen? I mean, Liverpool were incredibly strong at that time, really brilliant, brilliant players. And yet we seem to have the Indian sign over them. And um, so it was remarkable. And I, I must admit, this is this is what I came into the game for, to win to win medals, to win the medals. And if you had so, said to me uh, way back in, uh, well, let's say, let's say 1972, almost a year into my professional life when I played and played very poorly against Derby County in a game. If you'd said to me by the, uh, by the beginning of the, new, uh, the, the uh, new decade, you'll have won the European Cup twice and you'll have won the league. I think that uh, I would have asked you to go and get your head examined, you know. So um, obviously you weren't around at that time anyway, so uh, too young to remember. But uh, terrific days, Paul. Really, really terrific days, and uh, days that I look back on, obviously, with really fond memories. Uh, and like I was just reading there, like you've a forty-two game unbeaten streak, and I think it was Arsenal then who 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 bettered that. Then, mm-hmm. I mean, that's it's, it's, again it's, like for a club that a, were de- like in the say the Championship or Division or Division Two was it called then Division Two? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and to come up and yeah. then to do that is is literally. I don't think you'll see the likes of it again, if I'm being honest. Not a, 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 absolute, no, no, you are definitely will not. No, the football has changed so much now that absolutely no provincial club will come up and uh, and do what we uh, what we did. 
absolutely not. Funnily enough, I just uh, uh, was it last night, the night before, I caught some of um, a documentary about Manchester United, where um, where uh, Eric Cantona was actually doing, um, you know, in a semi-presentational mode, you know, where he'd be on speaking about his particular time at Manchester United. He was going back to the George Best days, Matt Busby's early days of Busby Babes. Anyway, the point I want to make, he did say that uh, he joined the football club. It was tailor-made for him. It was exactly what he needed at the time, needed a manager to believe in him. And it was Manchester United. And then he made the point, as, as did a couple of the other players, he felt we're unstoppable. Well, that's how we felt at, at, uh, at Nottingham Forest, that we've stepped into every single game. It didn't matter who we were playing, that we felt as if we were going to win this. And we had a very, very fine side. And because we had such a, a talently brilliant, brilliant, mercurial, charismatic manager, it kind of, it kind of overshadowed uh, at times the, uh, the, the players that we had doing the business on the field. For whatever a manager will do, he still needs the players to be able to perform. And while we had a brilliant manager, we had some really talented players, and which was credit to credit to Peter Taylor and Brian Clough for putting them together. But there were five of us who ended up winning these medals who were there at the football club before Brian Clough ever arrived. Yeah, because you're, you're like you were a big part of all of that because you were. I think you this four of you that were had the most appearances while Clough was there. But it seemed as though you kind of had a little bit of a strained relationship with him. Or maybe he was tough. Or maybe it was tough love on you. Uh, more so, I think you were maybe more intellectual than him, and he didn't like that if you got one up on no, him. I, I, no, no, he was. Uh, he he might not have been. He might not have had. Uh, the same the same length of education as I had, but he was a he was a smart boy, absolutely. You know, clever fellow. If he had an education, he would have been uh, he would have been uh, phenomenal. You know, he, he could have done he could have done anything he turned his hand to because he was so charismatic, and he was so quick witted, and he was he was just. But as much to the point, he was just a a brilliant manager, um, miles and miles ahead of his time. Um, and knew about knew about players, knew about what they thought what would be good for uh, for uh, for them mostly. And while uh, while I felt that he maybe he maybe could have dished out a little bit more praise in my direction, that was all. <laughs> and I felt that I might have actually I might have uh, responded even better to that. There, I think he saw a different side to me, and I think he felt that tough love was uh, what was necessary. And you know what? I have to say, Paul, he might even have been right. But eventually, it didn't matter to me, honestly, if we were going to win and I was going to be playing in the side and I was going to be involved in these big games, uh, that was, that. you know, you couldn't really ask for much more than that. Yeah, but like, because you, 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 you make that point in the book is that you missed out, obviously, on the, on the first European Cup and you felt as though your chance was gone. You play, you play the one against Hamburg, the one, the one with Kevin Keegan, captain in Hamburg, and then a half time in the game, this this just this bit stood out to me is the fact that he wanted to make a positional switch. I think he said in the book, and then mm. uh, you volunteer basically to do that, and he was mm. like, no, 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 you're playing perfectly fine when you are, and you go on to say then that that was uh, you've been waiting all this time for him to to give you this praise, and then he finally. He did it on the biggest probably stage of them all, and that kind of fired you up then to go to the second half. It's tr absolutely true, but absolutely, honestly, I I felt and I, it's it's like reliving the minute that or uh, the moment when you just you just mentioned it to, and it's genuinely it's like yesterday to me. No, he was um, we were under we scored the goal, we were leading, we were second favourites in the game, even though we were reigning champions because Hamburg had Kevin Keegan as you mentioned, the uh, uh, footballer of the year, I think the previous year. And uh, and a host of German internationals playing, and we had lost Trevor Francis, our main goal scorer, um, to injury a couple of weeks earlier. You know, we had to play a young kid in the side, so the the odds were against us at the time. But we'd scored first in the match through John Robertson, and uh, then Hamburg were starting to get the upper hand. But we were very very we were strong mentally as a side, but we were definitely under pressure in the last 15 minutes before half time. So. He waited until half time and he wanted to make some adjustments to the team. And then when I kind of volunteered, to, to uh, I don't know why I volunteered, and it's just 
he said, no, no, you stay there. You're doing brilliantly, son. And it was it was a massive lift. It was like, a, like well, I just really could not wait to get out for the second half because the manager thinks you're doing wonderfully well. And I, in the scheme of things, I, I, I might have been doing wonderfully well defensively for him because I was getting back and getting some challenges in. But we were we had been under the cosh for the previous fifteen minutes, so that was that was tough. It wasn't as if to say you're going up and dribbling past three or four players. It was the work that I was doing and getting back into positions, covering, and then getting a challenge in. So I think all of those things, oh no, I must admit, those are the type of things that uh, our manager looked for in those days because he felt that um, if you are doing that sort of work, then what can you not do? What can you not do then when you do have the ball? So that was a big moment, as you say. I wait, I wait all these years for that sort of praise, and then it comes in the final of the European Cup. I suppose it helped you get over the line, so it was, um, it was worth the moment itself. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, we, it didn't, it didn't mean that we weren't under the, a bit of pressure in the second half. Uh, we were, as as um, Hamburg <clears throat> charged forward, but we still had to, we had a strong mindset which was really important that's something that uh, i'm sure that the the uh, the manager gave us uh, but with some really fine players peter shilton made a couple of really good saves as well too and um, and we 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 held on in the game um where we definitely definitely had um, uh well let me put it this way Ham- hamburg for most of the game would probably had would had much more possession than we did but once we got in front hamburg knew it that we would be hard to break down. Yeah, um, but just look, like it's such a, it's such a, I don't want to say crazy, but it's it's a mad story of of you know coming from so low or low down the divisions to go on to dominate in Europe to dominate domestically, and you know it's, it, you I, you said there you must have been pinching yourself just being like what's going on, and I and I saw I read as well that like for forty years you were runners up uh, player of the year as well. Do you ever feel like you were ever going to get the the, the player? Do you know? I don't think that. Um, I. Do you know? Obviously, it mm. would be. It would more, be more to my point does it mean that you you had a big a big impact on the team? I, I, do you know what I think that I think that when you are in the side, I sometimes felt that, um, or I maybe didn't realize this, but you know, I just as it was, it was nice just uh, recently to speak to John Robertson, who was who was. Definitely our best player, best outfield player. Peter Shilton was a great goalkeeper, but John Robertson was where he was the fulcrum of the team. Really terrific footballer. But when John starts to give you praise, then um, about, and he's gone back. I Something I haven't done, Paul, I have never really watched a lot of Nottingham Forest football games back, you know, in, enti- in their entirety at all. Never wouldn't, um, um, wouldn't be able to tell you, wouldn't be able to tell you too much about uh, the European Cup final, believe it or not, other than little moments, you know, condensed moments here and there, can talk you through the goal, of course, because I've seen that often enough, but little moments I wouldn't have seen. But John Robertson just recently, I'm saying probably in the last year, uh, has decided, he would be the same as me, wouldn't have done this, but he's decided to go back and look at, at games again and for him to phone me up and say, hey, listen, Martin, you did really, really well in these games. That, that, that was nice to hear from a quality player. So I, I did have, um, I played in the side, I played I played all the big games, I missed out in the first European Cup final, um, I had been injured three weeks before that, so had Archie Gemmel, so we missed out in that. Whether, because Trevor Francis was eligible to play and Trevor Francis was a terrific player, whether whether I would have started in the game or not, I, I don't know, but um, um, uh, I think that someone... Um, Sorry, Brian Clough apparently has said at some stage or another, and he might just have said this for the sake of saying it, he said that if um, that if everybody had been fit, uh, Trevor Francis wouldn't have started in the game. I'm not so sure that that's true, Bob, because Trevor Francis is a quality player. And if I'm a football manager uh, now, and I didn't never looked at it from a, a viewpoint other than a player's perspective, then as a manager, I would like my very, very best players on the field at the time to try and win a football game. So I think sentiment, I might have to push to the corner. But I know what he means because we had an epic uh, uh, double uh, semi-final games against Cologne. 
uh, who were uh, double champions in Germany. He'd won the, F, the, the German Cup and the league the previous year and were adorned with international players. And we, we drew our first match at, 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 at home 3-3. And we had to go out and win in in um, in the semi final. We had to win out in Cologne, which we did do one nil. And I think Brian Clough was so euphoric after that there that if the final had been the following morning, he would have gone in with that team. And remember, Trevor Francis wasn't eligible to play in those games, so I think he would have done. So, uh, but I think when you have a bit of reason about you, I think that Trevor Francis, who scores the winning goal from a position I used to find myself in week in week out. You know, uh, waiting for John Robertson to cross the ball and I would be at the back post for it. So who's to say I would have headed the ball into the net? But it would be nice to have had that opportunity. Anyway, listen, I got my chance the following year. We played and we won and uh, I made up for everything. Yeah, well, it's, it's like because you look at like even Roy Keane, like he never got that moment back at Man United, at, you know, having um, got booked against Juventus in, uh, I think it was 99, uh, the treble winning season. He missed the final. And he didn't. Mm-hmm. He never got that back. So it was nice that you. You're probably one of very, very few that would be able to get that back. You know, that's true. And and you're considering that's Manchester United we're talking about as well too. In 1999, I think it was he had been he Roy had been so brilliant in the in the semi final. Um, I've been brilliant in all the all the matches, but there there he and Paul Scholes don't get this chance to play in the final, and you don't really feel part of it. And um, uh, Roy actually got injured a couple of days before that in the FA Cup final, uh, believe it or not. So he might not even have been fit enough to play in the final. I, I, I might, I might be missing that out. He maybe, maybe he was, but he certainly t- uh, took an injury in the FA Cup final, which I was at and watched the game. But not to for Manchester United not to get a chance, and for he, and for him himself not to get an opportunity to play in the European Cup final, that would be that would be kind of heartbreaking. And as I said to you, you never really feel part of it. At least I was a substitute. Archie Gamble was a sub. We never get on in the, the first final. And you still don't feel part of it. That's the whole point. You really don't feel part of it, regardless of what has happened, regardless of what the efforts that you've helped to get them to the final. If you're not playing, if you're not participating in that field, you definitely don't feel part of it. Um, you know, what was your top process when you, when you didn't get on? Did you think my mom has gone? Yeah, of course, absolutely. So Nottingham Forest, are, I mean, it was a brilliant effort to come and win the European Cup uh, first time. Uh, but uh, are, are we going to win it again? Oh, God, the chances are, you know, slim, relatively yeah. slim, relatively slim. So, of course, and at least I get it. Archie Gemmell was transferred a month or two later to Birmingham City. And, and it's an eternal regret in his, uh, on, on his part that he never participated in a final. And Archie Gemmell was a quality footballer. Yeah, my dad was a huge fan of his. Um, his son then signed for Everton later on in his career. I, I'm a big Everton fan of Scott Gemmell. Are you? Yeah. Right, tough times. Tough yeah. times at the moment. Let's not go there. Um, okay. <laughs> we might talk about them when we come to Villa. Um, no but we, at the moment, I don't want to talk about them. I was on a podcast earlier speaking about them and I just, yeah, we'll uh, we'll push that to the side. I want to speak to you about um, just uh, Northern Ireland, the World Cup. And um, I believe you masterminded that victory against Spain, the one that Jerry Armstrong scored that goal. Jerry gives me uh, Jerry gives me a lot of credit for it. But, but all I thought is that um, for, the, for the games, I had at least had a really good experience with Nottingham Forest of playing in European football. So I get, and, um, and not to say that some of some some of the other players weren't weren't doing that there, but at least I've had had those experiences. Billy Bingham made me captain of the side, and we had to win. We essentially had to beat Spain. Well, the, I felt at the time that um, my biggest concern was uh, was the referee, really, to who who could easily succumb to uh, to. Uh, you know uh, the sort of noise that was going to be at the uh, in the um, in the stadium. No, because they were and the I, host nation, yeah. Just in case. Yeah, the host didn't nation, know, yeah. absolutely in Valencia, and I'd say, and um, and a great old stadium as well too in Valencia. So um, uh, the Mastaya. But um, I, I was concerned about those things. But I felt, listen, try and take the referee out of the equation. Try and take try and take the diving that might take place during the course of the game, and the referee maybe maybe giving a penalty. If I take that out of it, then the important thing for us was not to be conceding early on in the game because the one thing that we were not great at uh, uh, with Northern Ireland, we weren't brilliant at chasing games. You know, we couldn't, 
we, you know, we had a really strong mentality. We bit like Nottingham Forest in many aspects, although Forest had a lot of uh, a lot of really talented players, and we could chase games at Forest. But once we got in front, either with the, with um, with Northern Ireland or 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 Forest, we would be hard to beat. So our, the the important thing for us was to quell the crowd, take the sting out of the game. We will get a chance or two. You know, definitely will. Uh, get a chance or two, regardless of what of whether uh, Spain have have loads of the ball or not. We will get an opportunity. We just have to take it. If it turns out the way that I described it to him, that might be uh, that might be more uh, uh, more coincidence than actually uh, than actually. Uh, no, I, I I I as captain of the side, I had a side in it. It's nice of Jerry to say these things, and as a way, and the game panned out the way that I. I described it to them, but as I said to you, listen, that's easier said than done. It's all right sitting around the table and saying, this is how we'll do it. We still had to go and perform. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I still, that's, again, when you, you speak about, you know, World Cup upsets and you see, like, Saudi Arabia beating Argentina and stuff like that, I'd, I'd say it was probably up there with, with those. Um... I, I think absolutely. It definitely, definitely would be. Definitely would be. There's no question about it. Uh, that um, that you know beating the host nation to qualify for what was quarterfinals of the World Cup that was uh, uh, listen it's sensational really when I think about it you know but uh, and sometimes sometimes I know that um, we um, we we like to celebrate a victory uh, and sometimes Northern Ireland we would might occasionally celebrate a defeat but um, I am joking in that but. Uh, I think that uh, there wasn't very much time to really, to really, uh, you know, to really celebrate. The night afterwards was obviously a big day, but then when we realised then that we're in the quarterfinals and that's uh, the following Sunday, I think, then you try and get your mind set for that. But um, we did have a bit of a surprise, Bob, when we found out that um, that the Nor- Northern Ireland, the um, the, um, the FA, the um, the Northern Ireland. Uh, Football Association, I uh, thought that we weren't going to qualify, and they had booked us in the flight home, back home, rather than going on to the, to Madrid for the uh, for the quarterfinals. So we had to um, there had to be a lot of last minute changing taking place. Back to the hotel very late um, uh, in the um, in the morning. Uh, it was a late kickoff, obviously in the evening time, and there we are. We're in now in the quarterfinals of the World Cup. Uh, but Billy Bingham, the manager, came down, gathered us together to say that um, that um, they're still looking for flights to go the following day to um, to um, over to Madrid. That's where our semi our, our quarterfinals were going to be played, and um, and we asked why was that. And he said oh, just that the uh, the Irish FA had um, had not thought that we were going to qualify. And therefore, had booked our flight back to London. I think it was. So we had to make these changes. But you know what? In the scheme of things, Paul, it didn't really matter. We knew that some stage or another, uh, we would be in Madrid for the Sunday, and it was just a. It was just so great. So we had a bit of a laugh about it. We pretended to be angry, and uh, and that the uh, Irish FA did not have great faith in us. But that, we 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 weren't really bothered. We were in the quarterfinals, and and nothing was going to stop us from being being involved in those games yeah so just on the the northern ireland stuff um that was obviously fantastic for your career you know uh, at that stage you're you know you'd be considered a very very good player and you'd have won a lot uh, in terms of your domestic career but your career was cut short through injury and you then get into management um how did your management career come about and was it something you always wanted to get into no it was not no not at all i it was something i'd never really thought about even in the latter stages of my playing career, didn't really think about management. Should have done, perhaps, but really didn't do. Um, and uh, and it was just a chance meeting, believe it or not, with um, uh, with uh, Peter Taylor, uh, who was Brian Clough's assistant, that uh, made me really start to think about it. Now, for instance, uh, Billy Bingham, uh, who was the manager of Northern Ireland, did pull me aside once and... and uh, asked me uh, had I thought about management. He said I thought yeah, I could do a job with that there because I could communicate reasonably well, blah, blah, blah. And um, But I was still playing at that time. So I, I, I thought, well, yes. And I, I, I'm not saying I dismissed it, but I never really gave it 
much thought. But here I wasn't playing anymore. My career's over. And um, and a chance meeting with Peter Taylor in Nottingham. One day he had also retired from the game. He had fallen out with uh, Brian Clough at this stage. and uh, But I met him just by, by chance in, in Nottingham. In fact, I tried to avoid him because mm-hmm. Peter and I hadn't really got on all that brilliantly. Uh, but here he was and he said to me, he said, you disappoint me. Uh, he said, I, he said, I thought you would go into management. And, uh, and I, and it was a sort of a backhanded compliment in many ways, but, uh, knowing Peter, he had to, he had to put you down first before he picked you up. And, um, and he said, yeah, you mean you're the two best teachers in the world, myself and, uh, and Brian Clough. And he said, I really thought you'd do it. He said, you know, so, and there, so I, I really did genuinely almost go home and, and give it some thought. And then I thought, well, OK, then if that's the case, then I'll start applying for jobs. Now, I did that rather unsuccessfully, uh, but I was in the mode or in the mood for, for doing that. So um, I started to apply for jobs that didn't get too many replies. And when I did get one particular one, they narrowed it down to one or two or one. In fact, myself, I got only one asked back to do it and didn't get the job. So um, that might tell you, but, but the interim manager got the job so um, uh, because the club had been starting to do well. Anyway, but um, eventually I got a knock on the door and uh, um, my own house in Nottingham, this is one of the directors of Grantham Town Football Club who were, you know, about 15 leagues below the football league, uh, asked me would I become over and be interested in being their manager. And it was two nights a week and a Saturday. Grantham was about 25 miles from Nottingham. I thought, well, listen, uh, I'll try and do that. And it really, it really, uh, it um, took off from there as much as anything else. I had an opportunity to manage Wickham Wonders, and uh, the job had been uh, given to um, a lad called Kenny Swain, who had won a European Cup medal with Aston Villa in 1982. Kenny was a very nice lad was assistant manager at Crew Alexander, wanted to break out in his own, was given the job at Wickham and then, uh, and then turned it down the following morning. I was a bit late with my, my application because I didn't know it was available. Uh, a fellow called Alan Parry, who's um, a football commentator, an athletics commentator that I'd known. He, uh, he was a director at Wickham Wonders and uh, he put my name forward. And uh, so I got the job almost by default. But it was the start of uh, the start of my managerial time in uh, really uh, in terms of something that was uh, that could lead to something. Yeah, because you worked your way up, then obviously up to up the leagues. I haven't obviously worked from the lower leagues, then through to Wickham, then obviously mm. then on to Leicester. Yeah, I do. I I must admit, I have a different viewpoint. Uh, different viewpoint from most people. Who feel as if that's the way the way to do it? And uh, no, I feel as if that uh, management uh, down at lower level is is fraught with difficulty because one they're saying oh you can gain experience and you can make your mistakes and they're not big they're not really public. But no, you make too many mistakes down there. You might not get an opportunity to manage higher up, and so therefore I made I, the Wickham Wonders job became the most important thing of uh, of my life really I, I had to make it work I, it was important for me to make it work because if i failed at wickham i might not get a chance to manage like sheffield wednesday or sheffield united or anything like that and so um and so i made it i made a determined effort to do it um i was out the night we were again we were training a couple of nights and then we maybe have a saturday game but every other night i was out watching football um seeing games both in the league that i'm involved in and also leagues below and and higher watching chelsea reserves every single um every single fortnight at uh, kingstonian ground watching that so i knew where players were mozzy is it for instance used to see him playing regularly for chelsea reserves so all of these things that uh, and uh, neil of... lennon at crew wasn't it as well neil lennon at crew yes i didn't i by that time i was actually manager of uh, leicester city when I was when I knew when I knew about Neil, so I didn't. I had um, um, that. That's um, here's here's my point. He had played against us for Crew against Wickham Wonders when we had got into the football league, but really 
uh, in terms of uh, in terms of me really thinking a great deal about him. No, I hadn't done at that stage. It was more. Yes, he was a formidable opponent and a, and a, a involved in a very 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 fine crew Alexander team. However, it was really when I was manager of Leicester that I got this opportunity to see him in three consecutive games, two two FA Cup matches and a league game, which would be unheard of. And it was in three games that I saw him that I saw enough for him to sign for Leicester. So those players I knew that existed and that, that there was talent in in the lower leagues. It was just a matter of finding them. Yeah, and I believe you locked uh, Neil Lennon in it. Was it your house or his house? To sign him it up. was his. It was his <laughs> house. We had this idea. Yeah, we uh, uh, we wanted to. Uh, John Robertson and I went up to see Neil. Neil had a Neil had an offer from uh, from Coventry City, and they were in the they were in a league above us. They were in the big league, managed by Ron Atkinson. So we had a we had a tough job to to um, to get Neil to sign for for Leicester City, who were we were trying to get promotion that season, and. Um, and I, as a manager at that stage, was having a difficult time trying to win some football matches. So for us to get uh, Neil's services was a major boost to us. As it turns out, he was uh, he was just simply superb. Yeah, um, and obviously he went on to have a, a great career with yourself at Celtic and, and Leicester. Um, talk to me about your successes at Leicester then, because you know I remember as a kid growing up that Leicester side um, winning the League Cup. Was it? Did you win mm-hmm. it twice? We did, yeah. We were in three finals. We won it. Uh, we won it twice and got beaten by Tottenham in the other one. Really fine side. Uh, sometimes it maybe uh, and up until Leicester City had won the league, and you would have to say in uh, in 2016, we probably had the best team. We had the best team in Leicester City's history, and I think that was proved by the the cup competitions that we won under a position we never finished out of the top ten in the uh, in the Premier League for four consecutive years. So we had a really good side. Um, very strong, very uh, again great mentality, but very good players. If you talk about, we had uh, midfield with Mozzie Izzet, with Neil Lennon, with Robbie Savage playing as well too up front. Emil Heskey, Stan Collymore was a good player. Uh, Tony Cotty, I know Tony was in the autumn of his career, but brilliant goal scorer. You had Matty Elliott playing. Uh, you had Tim Flowers in goal as well too. We uh, really, really fine, really fine team. There's no question about it. And uh, Frank Steve Sinclair Walsh, as well, wasn't he? Yeah. Frank Sinclair, Stevie Guppy as well too, playing wide for us. Um, honestly, and um, if I missed out any players, it's not because they weren't good enough. It's just because my memory's fading. Yeah, well, I just... Oh, sorry, I thought you were done there. Um, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, throughout your kind of managerial career, you, you kind of built teams a lot on I would say maybe character like some of those players that you you mentioned there like they always you, you, maybe not the most technical players in the world but what they would give you was you know a, a wholehearted performance and they'd give you more I suppose you would get more out of them than probably was expected right okay there was a couple of things to that there essentially essentially you're right it's really really important to have character but sometimes along the way, Paul, you're never sure, even though you, you think you know. When you're signing a player, and you hopefully have seen him enough times, and I did, uh, there was not a player at Leicester City that I hadn't seen play beforehand. So those decisions were down to me. But sometimes, you know, you think that you know about a player. You don't really know until you start to work with him. So we had to, yeah, you know, some uh, and some players have character, some needed character built, uh, uh, been, you know, filtered into their into their lives so what i'm saying is that uh, you are right the 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 team had a lot of character but i think sometimes that's overlooked by their or the their ability that they possess was overlooked mozzy is is it was a really skillful player at that stage probably not uh, uh, in his very early stages not good enough to play for uh, to play for Chelsea, Chelsea had a strong side. But by the time that Muzzy had finished playing at Leicester, he would have been good enough to play for 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 Chelsea. Was so he a Turkish international? Him. He was a Turkish international, exactly. Um, but Muzzy was uh, Muzzy was born in uh, in London, and um, so and because we had this big uh, a lot of character in the team, uh, again I think the ability was uh, was uh, was overlooked. Heskey was a strong player, as you're uh, likely to see. Neil Lennon was a brilliant footballer. And, uh, and Matty Elliott was just 
a ball playing centre half that you could only dream of. So these players that I that I bring to the football club have have not just character, but they've also got a a, a lot of talent. And um, and I think that um, uh, again, you know, because I think it was Neil Neil Lennon started he used the word uh, about Leicester City side. Oh, we're the grinders. Then suddenly that sort of name kind of stuck. And um, and because we had a couple of scruffy looking players playing for us, like Ian Marshall and um, and uh, Steve Claridge, sometimes that uh, that um, uh, scruffiness seemed to uh, apply to the side. We had a really good team, really good side, very 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 strong, very strong mentally, and uh, and a really fine side at the same time. So, in answer to your question, yeah, mentality is very very important. But these players could play a bit. And there's nothing I like more because I, I, I dribbled myself. There's nothing I like more than players taking other players on. You only have to ask Ashley Young and like Bon Lahore, players like this here. And um, that that's what I loved. And I encourage players to take to take people on. If they could do it, if, if that's not in your nature to do that, then don't do, do, do something else. But pass to someone who can. <laughs> uh, pr- pass to someone who can. Very good point. But uh, the the encouragement for players to take players on, and uh, and not don't worry too much if you lose it uh, a number of times because you will deal, you will go past them at some stage or another, and uh, and you will you will make chances for their centre forward. Mm, it sounds uh, sounds like Aidan McGeady, um, you know he loved to take on players, didn't he? I died, uh, Aidan absolutely. Aidan Aidan just didn't uh, uh, what uh, Aidan. I loved Aidan's ability. He just sometimes didn't know when to release it exactly. And you know, taking on once you've beaten a player, there's no you don't have to go back and beat him again. Once you've beaten him, left him for dead. But I, I can't forget um, Aidan's goals, particularly the ones against uh, Georgia in our very very first game in Georgia, which he won the match for us. Two magical goals that only he on the field could have done that at the time. But um, uh, yeah, Aidan, Aidan would um, eventually, uh, with the natural talent that he possessed, uh, he he should have. I'm sure he will not um, uh, not think that he's had a really good career. But it could have been uh, it could have been in a in a different stratosphere. Yeah, well, talk to me because you're speaking about different stratospheres. Going from Leicester to Celtic, um, how did that come about? And just how did you know how magnified it was going to be when you got to Glasgow? Oh, well, okay. Um, Not that Leicester all, weren't big, by the way, but I'm just saying. No, 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 no. Leicester, we just won that. We'd, we'd finished in the top 10. We'd qualified for Europe. This is for, for Leicester. And we qualified for Europe. And uh, and we finished and we just won the League Cup. And and everything was fine. And although Emil Heskey had left to go to... Uh, to um, to Liverpool at the time, we got eleven million pounds for him, which was a lot of money at that at, at that stage. And uh, and the chairman of the football club, Mr. Elson, said, you know, we'd be able to use a good deal of the money, a good deal of the money, to try and strengthen the side. So everything was looking fine. Then this opportunity uh, to manage uh, Celtic came through Dermot Desmond and Alex Ferguson. Dermot asking Alex Ferguson who would he recommend for the job and. I was one of a couple of people that Alex recommended and Dermot Desmond spoke to me and we got on really, really fine and I became the manager and he had, uh, he had a number of other choices. So I, I thank him greatly for that opportunity. So that came in uh, the summer of 2000. Uh, now, to answer your second point, Celtics, Celtic, other than stopping Rangers from going 10 in a row in one particular year, had had a tough old time of it in the past, past decade. So I was hoping to try and change um, change their fortunes round. Easier said than done, I think, but uh, that's what I was uh, trying to do. And uh, but did I did I realise what this sort of task was, and did I realise what I'm uh, I'm letting myself in for? In truth, be known, but probably not. I um, uh, I think that uh, there was a, a a feeling that that I should do. I, I as growing up. In Northern Ireland, uh, if you're a Catholic, you're supporting Celtic. If you're a Protestant, you're supporting Rangers. So I knew all about that. That's fine. I knew about the great 67 side as well, too. Uh, all of, uh, Again, Jock Steen. But did I, was I prepared 
uh, for the sort of scrutiny that that you are under uh, every single day, not just not just in the lead up to a game, not just in the immediate aftermath of a game, but every single day. Probably wasn't used to that and didn't think it. Uh, but that was that was the nature of it. And you either decide it that this is part of the life and you just get on with it, or you or you sink. And I decided that this is going to be part of my life. Yeah, but like what a period that was. I remember being a kid and um our family who obviously here would be Celtic fans, I was growing up as well. And then you would be going up to the pub and everyone up there is a Celtic fan and if you mm. were to actually ask you know, a six, seven year old me, if I would you be sitting here speaking to Martin O'Neill all these years later, having seen everything he's achieved? It's it's mad. It's like what a team that was. You know, you had Larson, Hartson, Sutton, Alan Thompson, Neil Lennon, Didier Agat, um, then you bring it back to, you know, Jackie McNamara, all these players. There was just so many good players and they're competing at a really, really good level. Like, let's not forget, obviously, the UEFA Cup run, getting to that final against that side, Mourinho's Porto, who obviously went on then to win, to win the league, yeah. and then the Champions League the year after. But like, yes, right. that final for me, and I'm not sure how you feel about it because I haven't read the whole book yet, but like, the amount of diving and play acting throughout that final was just so frustrating watching at home. I can only mm-hmm. imagine how frustrating that would be being there, being the manager against the opposition. And what a performance. Like Henrik Larsson, just what a player. Absolutely. Well, I agree with you in every aspect. One, Larsson was a phenomenal player, great goal scorer, brave as a lion, brilliant, brilliant player. And it's good to see that he did so well at Barcelona and he did so well at Manchester United afterwards. Yeah. So that would quell those rumours that he could only only play in the the SPL. Um, secondly, I totally agree with you. Uh, Porto did not have to. Porto had a lot of talented players. They went on, as you say, to win the Champions League the following year. Play acting was um, was uh, bordering on the ridiculous. Really was ridiculous, and that was uh, and it was hard to take. I must admit, really, really hard to take. Um, we could and should have won the game. It's a shame, really. Baldy gets sent off uh, in extra time, and uh, we're down to ten men. But we had, um, we had, you know, we played to maybe overuse word valiantly, and we certainly had done that. And we could easily, we could easily have won the game. Um, you can see that a really soft goal uh, to to lose the game at three two. And as you say, that side, virtually the same side, Porto go on to win the Champions League the uh, the following year. We the next year should have been. Um, we are a minute away from being into the knockout stages, and we could, we could have uh, easily have uh, have done well in a in uh, in a two legged affair, particularly at, at Celtic Park. But um, yeah, so Bobo Baldi handles the ball in the last minute when Leon against Leon, we could have gone through. We could have easily have gone through in our very first year. We got nine points. Nine points had won all the games, including Juventus. Juventus got a a really soft, soft penalty in the first game to beat us 3-2 in, in Italy. And we get nine points from that group, Paul. We, I could talk to you blue in the face. No, I'm, t- I'm sorry, until I'm blue in the face about what, what could have happened, sliding doors moments. But even so, the side was uh, terrific. And I think you made the point at the beginning of your question is that it was European football. And that's that's what this side was being judged on. and uh, And we... Uh, we we more than held our own in European football, you know, more than held our own, and um, and we were up playing against some big sides with Bayern Munich. Uh, we knocked the next year after the UEFA Cup final, we got to the quarter final, which sometimes people forget, knocking Barcelona out along the way. So we had um, we had a really quality side. Had we got into the knockout stages, which we should have done anyway, in two of two of two of those years. Um, who knows what might have happened but listen it, it is what it is now at the end of the day but again I get back to you about the UEFA Cup final that was um, really massively disappointing disappointing and remains a big disappointment I, yeah I, I, so I can see why like cause it was such a good Celtic team um, but from your oh, you got your, your tea in the end of your coffee Finally, uh, under under sufferings, I think she's uh, sent it up to me. Mm, um, right. <laughs> but uh, I think just 
Go ahead. S- sorry. Um, I was just going to say, um, just look, looking back, like what a period that was for Celtic. I don't think they've really had those highs since there's been a couple of times under maybe Neil, Neil Lennon, but maybe not, not to the level or to the extent, I don't think, um, the, in terms of European and competing regularly and, and, and like really putting it up to teams. And the strength of that squad that you assembled at the time as well was was a fantastic uh, team. But is that probably your your is that your favourite period of management? No, I, I, you know, I, I loved all the clubs that I, I went to generally and I went I loved my time at Wickham. If those players at Wickham Wonders had not put the effort in that uh, that they did do, like a phenomenal effort to try and get promotion, try and win those little trophies that we did do. Perhaps my, I might not have had the opportunity to come. So I depended on those players at Wickham. Yeah, that's fair. For that, I'm eternally, I'm eternally grateful for that. Had they had just decided, no, 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 don't fancy this. I'll rather do, uh, rather do another job or something this year. It could be so different. Then I go to Leicester, torrid time to begin with. Can't win a game to save my life early on. Then being able to turn that round and to be, um, to uh, to do the things that we did at Leicester were really great. I loved that and Celtic obviously a special time really because as a you know as a club you're growing up with it it's a privilege to manage the football club always has been and I think I'm hoping I would still say that even if we'd never won a game but uh, who knows but um, great and I enjoyed my time at, at, at Aston Villa unfortunately sometimes I ended up falling out with people that maybe I, sh- I shouldn't have done so that might be as my fault as much as anybody else's but even so I know. I, it was great. I loved it. I loved uh, Celtic. It was particularly special. And you mentioned a group of players there you're talking about. We're a top, top quality team. And uh, and we could compete in Europe, as, as we proved. And we were very, very close a couple of times. I think that Celtic now, this is the step that Ange will have to take, I think, and can, and can do with a little bit of experience behind him. Uh, that doesn't mean he has to change principles or or um, or um, anything else like that. They're just tinkering here and there a little bit. And with a wee bit of luck, next season in the Champions League can really, really uh, use the experience of last year. I take that into into consideration and um, and you never know. Things can improve. But great to see Celtic in really good hands now. I know I'm digressing for, for a moment or two. That's great. And as I say, things look, look promising. But for us, we had a really fine side. And at this minute, to date, my own particular view is, and um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's held by a, a, a quite a number of people, but I would say outside the best team that Celtic have ever had is obviously the 1967 side because they won the European Cup. But I'd say that our, the team that I had would be, would be the second best side that, uh, that Celtic have had over, certainly in the last 50 years. I think that's fair comment. To be fair, um, I suppose. Well, just I'm just looking there. Uh, you you obviously went then to Aston Villa. Um, you had a great period there. You were continuously finishing in the top six there, alongside Everton, my team, as I mentioned earlier. Um, mm-hmm. Back then, when there were good times, but uh, you had such a good. Yeah, you, know, you know, I I don't. I don't want to go into it too much because I want to get to, to Ireland. Um, and, no problem. Um, I'm conscious of your time. So and like, I'm looking there, like John Crew, James Milner, Ashley Young, Gabby Ogbonahor, uh, Brad Friedel. You had so many. Again, you assembled a great squad there again. And you must have really enjoyed your your time and period there. I know you said you fell out with people and stuff like that, maybe the chairman and stuff, which has been documented. But you mm. must look back on that. Really big club. And, um, you know, probably when you, when you left, they kind of fell away and, and lost away a little bit. Well, and yes, and um, and at this minute, uh, if I say so myself, I think that um, uh, it might be on uh, the the manager they have in place at this moment. Emery, Emery yeah, uh, certainly, certainly, uh, he's proved himself as an excellent manager. I thought he was um, maybe got a bit of harsh treatment at at, um, at Arsenal, but even so, he's an excellent manager, and I think they're on, on the up. But they have spent an awful lot of money trying to get to the place that uh, that we got with. And I know things have changed in the last number of years, but with, uh, I mean, the most money I ever spent in any player was £12 million on James Milner. And, we, and they ended up going to Manchester City for 24. So my point, Paul, is this, that, yeah, Leicester, or sorry, that um, Aston Villa now hopefully have some good days. We had a very fine side, really fine side. 
and I think that um, I think that if the um, if the uh, let's say my my final the, the final year there that had um, had the referee in the League Cup final against Manchester United uh, done the job and uh, sent off Vidic uh, in the second minute of the game, which he should have done really because Vidic had committed the uh, a foul. We did get the penalty. We scored from that there. It was last we, man, wasn't it? it? Yeah, but last man. He was last man. We should have gone on to have won the. We would, I think, even. I mean, Sir Alex Ferguson. Don't get me wrong. One of the greatest managers ever lived. Um, uh, I would have something to say about it, even with ten men. But we had so much energy and and uh, running ability in the team at that time. That I do think that that early start at Wembley, particularly against ten men for most of the game, I think we'd probably have gone on to have won. Who's to say? It? You know, that's conjecture now at the end of, but that would have been nice to have won that and I do think that if we'd been able to maybe keep the players together I think that and maybe a couple of more additions because I didn't think that the youth team much and all as they were doing fine I didn't think the youth team players were ready to cope with um, to cope with uh, the type of football necessary to try and get into the top four yeah I just really remember uh, one particular victory it uh, was Villa won 3-2 um, against Everton oh, Do you at Goodison Park Ashley Young one of my worst recalled memories um, Jolien Lescott I think had equalised and then from the tip off I think it was Ashley Young then uh, scored he, he came on to it and hit first time from a back pass from Phil Jagielka he did he scored a goal and I'm racing onto the pitch and I remember saying I was caught on camera saying world, world class and it was a world class moment I did not but people tried to say that um, that O'Neill's comparing Ashley Young to Messi, and I never did. I don't know how they go from that. It was uh, there. There were definitely moments in football matches where Ashley Young was unplayable, and I know he had a habit of maybe because of balance, maybe going down sometimes, we bit too, but uh, rather easily. However, overall he was fantastic for us. Really fantastic. He could beat players. Not only that, well, he could also. He could chase back. He could do. I could have played. If, generally speaking, even though he was right-footed player, he could play left left wing. I could have played left back uh, if Ashley Young was in front of me because it just he would do my job as well too at the same time. So his energy, his uh, ability overall was fantastic. And I remember saying because that was a great moment, as you say, Everton had just equalised at Goodison. I didn't see many time on the clock, and. Um, and Ashley Young comes up and scores this wonderful goal to make it three-two, and I couldn't. And um, and you just it was that sort of encouragement you, you you would give to players of that sort of ability as well too that made the job worthwhile. Yeah, I was just uh, I, I I was just thinking there like you probably with a bit more money you maybe could have between Everton and Villa maybe if if they both had a bit more money they could put it broken into that top four at the time because it was pretty much wide open like Spurs weren't as strong maybe as they are now and some of the mm-hmm. other clubs that kind of came through City City were only kind of starting off to kind of with their riches you're, you're absolutely correct absolutely Manchester City were just starting on hence James Milner leaving uh, Gareth mm. Barry had gone the previous well, Gareth year Gareth Barry what a player by the way sorry I never, yeah cl- absolutely so you're right Manchester United and Arsenal were vying for it there's no question about that there but Manchester City were just starting on their on their on their journey and Tottenham Hotspur, teams that you see that we're in competing with, you know. And I think Aston Villa would accept that now at the moment. But anyway, listen, uh, it was, it, it was, um, unfortunately, as I say, my, myself and Mr. Uh, Lerner had a bit of a tiff and, um, and uh, I left the football club. We wish you'd, uh, wish you'd uh, moments to live over again and my, things might have changed, right? But anyway, listen, that, that's, so be it, Paul. It's happened and I can't undo it. Yeah, well, you moved to Sunderland. Um, well, you didn't go directly from from Villa, but you you went to Sunderland there. I'm mm-hmm. gonna just kind of um briefly touch over Sunderland, and we'll get to Ireland, and then I'll let you go because mm-hmm. I know you're you're meeting someone soon. Um, so just on Sunderland, again, good Irish contingent. You supported them as a boy. Was going there a big moment for you? Um, yeah, fun enough. Yeah, it was a big moment. I wanted to, um, I wanted to manage the football club. Niall Quinn, um, uh, was um. Uh, was heavily heavily involved in my uh, in my going there, and um, and Niall. What I hadn't realised that was Niall was um, 
Niall had been the um, kind of chief executive in many aspects, really, uh, with um, the with the owner in charge, the owner being Ellis Short. What I hadn't realised is that um, that um, that um, Niall and Ellis were not getting on too well, and and Niall was taking on um, an ambassadorial role, really, because he was trying to expand Sunderland's interests in in particularly in Africa at the time. So I hadn't realised these particular things, but I wanted to go to the football uh, football club. I wanted to manage Sunderland. I wanted to pull. I think them out you. I think Sunderland there. maybe had an African sponsor. Then would that be right? I think that's right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Asma and, uh, I think played then maybe too. Yeah. So uh, I have to say this in, in defence of myself. I the the day the day my first game in charge was a Sunday. It was against Blackburn Rovers, and by the time that the games had been played at the weekend, by the time that we played in the Sunday afternoon, we had dropped into the bottom three. So um, and we won this game very late on, two late goals, <clears throat> one to equalise, no, 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 another one to win. And um, we started to win some games. We lost our second game against uh, against Tottenham, but then we went on a really good run over over the Christmas period. Excuse me, Paul. And um, and um, so we got out of trouble rather too easily in many aspects. And. Um, I think that the chairman thought, you know, you know, the team's really fine, but in all honesty, it was it was going to be a struggle. Um, the only the emergence of James McLean did uh, James did brilliantly for us, and he was um, he was a big part in the resurgence of of, uh, of Sunderland at the time, and um, so suddenly he was like a breath of fresh air. He was one of the very few players that we had. I think it was only he and Cessignon could actually uh, could actually go past players. At the time, so that was that was uh, a major bonus for us. But overall, uh, 15, 16 months in charge of Sunderland, and um, uh, I was relieved of my duties after we had thirty-one points in thirty-one games. Um, another five points would have seen us through, but um, uh, Ellis Short wanted to make a change, and I was obviously massively disappointed with that there because I think it would have kept them up, and then maybe, but there was the, uh, you know. We had um, uh, we had um, not the best team at our disposal, but that sounds as if it's an excuse. You do you get? Um, I had a I had a major major job to get uh, Stephen Fletcher into the football club, and um, as it turns out, Stephen Fletcher's goals over the season, although he missed out some matches through injury, but Stephen Fletcher's um, goals and Simon Mignolet's goalkeeping essentially were the two main um, the two main considerations for staying in the division that year. So from that viewpoint, um, it's just disappointing, really disappointing that uh, Sunderland, the team that, as you say, I supported as a boy, wanted to do, you know, really these big dreams of uh, of qualifying for Europe with Sunderland. I'd like to have done. It wasn't to be. Yeah, I think that's the the ruthlessness of football. Um, yeah, but- it happened. Yeah, but uh, you you obviously then become the uh, manager of the Republic of Ireland, and um, at that kind of period, it was probably tough because Trapattoni um, had gotten us to the Euros, and then obviously it kind of tailored towards the end, and then it was going to be a tough job no matter who got it then to come in to try and um, get us to a tournament. And I think you'd met John Delaney, and then you'd you'd said this is from from what I read anyway from your book. Um, you wanted to bring Roy Keane in because you'd worked with him at ITV and you were impressed with, obviously, his... I think you described it as an insatiable um, what want to win games. And then, obviously, Stephen Guppy as well, I think, was someone you wanted to bring into to work with the wide players. So you had that chat with John Delaney. He he um, nearly fell off his seat, I think you said, for... Uh, because he had problems with Roy previously. Uh, I don't really want to go on to talk about John Delaney too much because of all the stuff that's kind of come out since. But uh, just in terms of your, you know, yourself, were you delighted to join the Republic of Ireland? Um, and uh, what were your kind of thoughts as you got appointed? Okay, right. <clears throat> A few months had elapsed then after after uh, Sunderland. And Dermot Desmond got in touch with me and said, listen, stop moping around. He said, go on and uh, there's a job here. Um, uh, Trapattoni had left, as you say, and Trapattoni had been a, obviously a brilliant manager. You only have to look at his uh, his, um, his career, and he had whatever. You, I know the results in the in the World Cup qualifiers after 
the Euros have been disappointing, but he did lead the team into uh, into the Euros in, tw- in 2012. And the results, <clears throat> I think there was a ferocious expectation at that time, Paul, that uh, Ireland would just sweep the board, really. They were in a tough old group, but they were well beaten in the games and they didn't... They didn't um, do all that well, and that kind of carried on into the into the qualification games. So Trapattoni leaves, and um, and I got a chance to go and manage the team, and I so absolute privilege to to manage the Republic of Ireland, and I felt that um, I had to, I although I'd never managed at international level before, I of course I had loads of experience of, of club football, and I knew exactly what man um, the international management. Um, entailed you were going to get us a, a, a little not very much time with players you know transfers you had to work with what you have and in essence we didn't you know we had a lot of uh, a couple of nice up and coming players but we had um, uh, essentially outside uh, uh Seamus Coleman and there wouldn't be that many others uh we you know we had boys who are playing in the championship so the most important thing for me and my my next contract with the Republic of Ireland depended on us qualifying for the Euros. So it doesn't mean that I might not get one if we did really well, but the only guarantee is that I've, we, had, we had to qualify for the Euros. And that was and that's, that was fine. This is what the, I'm in competition. This is what I want to try and do. And, of course, I bring Roy Keane along. And Roy, i talk about him in a second or two, but qualification for the Euros is what I wanted to do. So it was a matter of moulding a side together, getting them in the couple of days that we would have with them, trying to get a strong mentality to get the players to have a lot of self-belief that they go onto the field and they compete against Germany or they compete against Italy or they compete against Bosnia and they can compete against um, uh, Poland, teams like this here. You've got, to, you, you've got to be able to have that for a start. So the mentality has to be strong. Secondly, in terms of pattern of play, you don't get that much time with it, Paul, but overall... Set pieces become very, very important. They've decided, they've decided World Cups, and therefore corner kicks and free kicks and such things that guess here, both offensively and defensively, are still very important. And even if you haven't time to practice every single minute with it, you at least you can walk through them with players, get them into their positions, do all of these things. These are the things that you're trying to do in a couple of days. Also, am I with the respect? And let's be saying that. Am I going to technically improve players from a Monday to, a, let's say, to a Thursday morning? Uh, uh, listen, hogwash. Absolute hogwash. And it is, and it remains hogwash. And anyway, uh, Guardiola couldn't improve the players from Monday to Thursday in, in, in the length of time. He can over a number of years at the end of the day. So that's not what international football is about. You have to try and win football games. I had this dream or not a dream, I had this image of the great, great days of Jack Charlton when Jack Charlton came and, and had a brilliant side, brilliant players. Uh, <clears throat> Liam Brady had a struggle getting into the team. I might tell you about things. But Jack Charlton had a method of playing. But what happened is because Ireland at that time had never qualified for the competitions, it was uh, Jack Charlton was fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant manager at the time. Knew what, knew what the strengths and weaknesses of the team and got them playing. And the scenes when, uh, you know, the, for the qualification of the games, the Unreal, yeah. the brilliant moments, the great moment in Stuttgart, all of those particular things. And and the, particularly the scenes at the airport and uh, and coming back into Dublin afterwards, just fantastic. And I really wanted that. I wanted us in our way to have a, at least a try and try and relive some of those moments. And the only way to do that is to try and qualify for the competitions and actually try and do OK when you're out there. So all of these things in the back of my mind, and that was the driving force of it all. Just keep keep the Jack Charlton thing in your mind, because the the uh, the Poland and you the Poland affair hadn't gone so well, although the, the fans were there in in big big numbers. So I was hoping to, particularly if you could get to France and it wasn't that far to travel, that we would send big big numbers to uh, to France if we could make it. So the night that we beat Germany was a great, great night. Uh, but the night that we qualified when there was a finality to it when we beat Bosnia was just sensational. Really great, really great moment. And the time that we had out in France when working with the players for a number of weeks, you had a, a sort of a club mentality about it all. Those are terrific days. And I, and I 
can't forget those particular days. They were really they were per- particularly special. And our moment, that moment when Robbie Brady scores a great goal against Italy and for us now to be in the knockout stages of the competition. Really terrific. Really. But, you know, my, um, my um, relationship with the, the journalists was never, I don't think was ever great uh, to begin with. And certainly if you see some articles, particularly one, uh, um, an article from a journalist who um, had... Um, uh, well, said, um, did an article just after we'd qualified for the competition, qualified for France, and said that, um, however, uh, what O'Neill would have been answerable to if they hadn't have done. And then he gives a list of all the things that he, I'm sure that he had stored up thinking that we weren't going to qualify. So, listen, it is what it is that, you know, you deal with it. I didn't, I, I'm sure I didn't deal with it too cleverly myself at the end of the day. But um, we, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I can't, I, I, I just think that the days were particularly special then. Then we go into the, um, the qualification for the World Cup and we get to, we're four seeds in the group. We actually qualify for the playoffs and, um, and uh, we draw out in Denmark, well beaten in the second game, really well beaten. Of course, absolutely, I should, should take the flag for it. Well beaten, but it was, um, you no, know, to be said that this was a, um, uh, a sackable offence here to be beaten in the in that for if we could have won that game, we were leading one nil with two great chances to to put the game beyond them. It didn't it didn't materialise, and so we've lost the game heavily because Ericsson was in a different class at the time, and we get beaten. So um, and I think you know I think that that was um, uh, obviously a, a really disappointing moment for me. Disappointing for for the crowd who maybe had thought that. You know, arriving at the Aviva, that we could make it to to Denmark, and and it wasn't to be. But if you're asking me uh, about the about the Euros, it's just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, because I was just like a lot of it kind of gets overshadowed. If you look back at the Bosnia game, the Germany game, having lost to Scotland, to then bounce back against Germany was was unbelievable, and that put us in a great position to get back into qualifying. We obviously had the um, the playoff we won the playoff and i think again like i I go back to these i know you didn't transfer these players in but you go back to characters and players um, and leaders robbie Keane, john o'shea john walters seamus coleman james mccarthy richard kyo uh you know shane long wes houlihan all these players who 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 kind of came in through at that time and i think towards the end of your time a lot of them were kind of coming towards the end of their careers um and I think that was kind of that would have been their last probably tournament in terms of World mm. Cup and stuff like that as well. Like Robbie Keane at that stage had already been aging, but um, you know, and, and no disrespect um, to uh, I'm after forgetting his name now up front, um, Daryl Murphy. Sorry, mm. um, you know he was he wasn't a prolific goal scorer, but what he did was a job. And then you had you know Jonathan Walters who you deployed a lot on the right hand side. Mm-hmm. Um, who was fantastic as well. Maybe not a, like a household name, but what a you know workhorse for the team. And he scored big goals, like the the Bosnia playoff, for example. Uh, he was huge in that. And and Robbie Brady, I probably left out in those list of names as well. Who is still a very much an important player for the national team at the moment. You haven't scored that penalty there recently. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, like despite the, I suppose the Denmark loss, but um, you know the high of beating Wales in Cardiff when James McLean scored that goal as well um, you know I suppose that game itself it wasn't the best football but to get the win the way we did it was a smash and grab go, uh, you know win do you look mm. back on the Denmark game almost where you, you think maybe after that you, you might have walked away would that have been best or did you feel like mm. you had a point to prove <clears throat> I probably I probably didn't really want to leave it with it with that um, in, in that mode yeah you know the to me the next, the next, the next part of it was trying to rebuild a, a, a team, and we had some friendly games that were organised. We were away at Turkey. We played in France. We played a lot of teams with France before going to to the World Cup, and um, that was in March. Which yeah, yeah. Which eventually they won, and things that you see here. But to me, the competition, the uh, the competition, we didn't we didn't play well in the matches. Don't get me wrong. Not for one minute did we play well in the games. But the competition, you know, the Nations Cup thing, which was like a glorified friendly, glorified friendly games. I mean, for instance, Northern Ireland never picked up a point in it. 
but it didn't it didn't seem to concern uh, Michael O'Neill. He, he Michael O'Neill made it from the outset. He said, "I'm not worried about these games. They're just like to me friendly matches." <coughs> Excuse me. And no one actually knew all the rules at the time, as it turns out. Um, even though we we drew a couple of games against um, um, against um, Denmark, uh, well beaten in Wales in Wales, drew against uh, sorry got beaten by Wales in the second game in Dublin when we actually had two great chances to win the game before they ever scored. Um, those games should have been taken in the in the context in which they were. Eventually, um, when I left the job, I, I, um, the Republic had still had chances to qualify for for the Euros, a number of chances, and I think that uh, I think Stephen took over when they were actually in the semi final of the of a, of a competition and could easily have gone through. Yeah, so the point one or two saying, playoffs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. The point I'm saying is this here that I felt that. Uh, Yes, the the result against um, the result against um, against Denmark seemed to uh, obviously uh, paint a, a really um, a, a very dark picture over over proceedings. When I uh, when I think that um, this was actually a playoff game of which, as I say, to in a group of which we were initially four seeds, and um, and I think that that seems to get overlooked in many aspects. However. North, uh, sorry, Ireland qualifying for competitions. This is what, this is what I, I, I wanted to qualify. I wanted, really would love to have gone to Russia. That would have been really important. I'd like to have uh, gone to Russia uh, because of the experience that we had in France. And to me, the opening game in France, in Paris, when we, had, um, when we played Sweden, and, and coming out onto that there and listening to the national anthems being played, and the crowd, and we must have had maybe twenty to twenty-five thousand people in that stadium. That's to me what, what it's all about: the qualification, the getting there, and all the hard work that we had put in seemed, in just in that moment or two of the crowd being there in 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 the, in, the, in the stadium, the singing at the top of their voices, that made it all worthwhile. It's total vindication of all the all the tough tough games that we had played, the matches you say to lose in Scotland. To lose in Scotland, to get a late draw against uh, Germany and Gelsenkirchen, to um, John O'Shea, who, yeah, goal. yeah, absolutely, to win the game against Germany, to uh, to beat Bosnia over the two legs, to be playing in a in the first match in in Bosnia where we had to play the uh, the fog coming down in the last twenty minutes of the game where you could hardly see the far side of the pitch. All of those things to me were all part of that there when when we were actually. Uh, witnessing, you know, 20, 25,000 people um, uh, singing the national anthem and, and uh, singing at the top of their voices. And then uh, Wes Hulan scoring a great goal for us as well, too. So all of those things are really important. Um, and I think that, uh, again, seem to get overlooked in, in proceedings. However, you know, we did get beaten against Denmark, well beaten in the game. Would it have made any difference if we had lost... Uh, uh, two one in the match or something, I guess, and uh, and, and board it up shop. I'm afraid I, that's not my nature. I'd rather lose the game. If we when we need a chance to to try and score a couple of goals, so we made a couple of I made a couple of changes at half time. Ian McGeady and Wes coming on that might give us a wee bit of creativity. But I knew that we would lose loads in terms of uh, in terms of strength and in terms of uh, uh, just just. Um, uh, yeah, just essentially uh, uh, physicality as much as anything else. And the next goal would become very, very important. As it turns out, Denmark scored it. We tried to chase the game when we got well beaten in a match. But I don't think, I think I, these things can happen, can happen to the best, can happen to the best managers in the country, can happen to and Denmark go on and, um, and play wonderfully well in Russia, and I think I think might have gone out in penalty kicks against uh, against Croatia. Might be wrong about that, but uh, certainly, um, uh, certainly uh, they did the. Um, I think acquitted that, themselves really well. I think uh, Eriksson's obviously gone on to prove what a um, world class player he is, despite obviously what happened to him um, in the last uh, tournament. But it's great to see, or not or the Euros, mm. uh, the last Euros, I meant to say. Um, but um, a lot of people had got on to us, and I know you spoke about this already on Talk Sport about uh, Declan Rice and the situation with him. But um, I don't want to go on over it too much. But 
um, when he was being called up, did you know that he was um, being, you know, touted by England? Or did he say to you that, in, in a sense, that he was going to play for England and while he was still being called up? Or was the intention you thought he wanted to play for Ireland? Okay. Well, Declan Rice, first of all, he played in, he played in three games uh, for us at senior level, but obviously not competitive level. Um, Declan Rice, his dad, his family, and everybody, everybody uh, concerned with the whole thing knew of what the rules were. Declan Rice knew what the rules were. And I'm certainly not going to coerce someone into playing for us or, as the, as the journalists might think, dupe someone into playing for us because the people know the rules. They know what the rules are. And... Of course, I would, I would want it if Declan Rice to play. I saw in some uh, talent in him that, that wasn't apparent at the, at the, at the time, uh, really by his uh, club manager, he, although he was only a young lad, but he was trying to break into the team. I think that... Pellegrini, um, I think it was, yeah. Pellegrini was in charge. I think they opened the season uh, in a match. They got well and truly hammered in a game, and then he got left out for matches. I remember speaking to Declan in his house and saying to him, Pellegrini doesn't know your capabilities at this minute. Just allow, allow that, you know, time will, time will tell. He will have you back in that side again. As it turns out, it was, it was true. And Declan's never really looked back. But Declan Rice, and Declan was born in England. His father had, um, had uh, certainly uh, empathy with his uh, case for, for the Republic of Ireland. But Declan is uh, a character. What did he see? Of course, did I did I know that England were interested in him? They were certainly interested in him after he had uh, after he had played um, uh, some of the games for us. Uh, absolutely. And was the English manager going to allow somebody that he might have a bit of talent? He might not have promised uh, Declan the, uh, that he was going to play. You know, he's going to play what fifty odd? What is it? Thirty seven, fifty times, or whatever the case he's done now. In the meantime. But is he going to let him? Is he going to let him go? Particularly when the player was actually born in the country, and had, um, regardless of pl- playing some games for for the Republic of Ireland, had still um, still would want to play for the country of his birth. It's really it's as simple as that. It was exactly the same with um, with uh, Grealish as well too. So um, and it's their choice. It's absolutely their choice. And coercion is not part of the deal if they want. And would you would you say that now at this minute with um, that that Declan Rice or 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 Grealish have um, have um, thought twice about the decision to play for for England? Uh, Grealish has gone on to um, to play for England. He's gone on to have a hundred pound hundred million pound move from Aston Villa to Manchester City. And Declan Rice has been talked about as going, perhaps now going to Arsenal or Chelsea in the summertime. So, and has had and has had um, a number of big, big games, experiences with uh, with England at uh, at World Cup level and European Championship level. So, this idea that uh, that the player, the family, or anybody that didn't know the rules, everybody knew the rules. That's the point. And so, and um, and it would be nice if you'd. Uh, it's, he, he's got a choice to make, and the choice is, and he is, it's a free will, as they, as they used to say way back, a free will, and he chose to play for England. And do you think he's regretted it today? I would hardly think it. Yeah, I just think uh, a lot of fans felt as though he kind of used the system to his advantage. Not so much you, but more so, obviously, Declan. But you. Can't... But that, 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 that's the question. That would be a question for, yeah, uh, for, for, for Declan, not, not for mm-hmm. me. But I could see the talent in them here, and, and I have to say, I think I saw that talent before perhaps England saw it. However, that's not the point. And of course, he had an agent at the time that was um, was directing him very, very strongly to England. So all of those things, and and I'm sure he would looked at, um, and the agent would have been not doing his job if he didn't show him the uh, his earning potential, uh, certainly commercially, if he was uh, if he was going to play for England rather than rather than Ireland. Okay. Really, so I don't, um, and I, I think, I think having to try and uh, and seemingly seemingly defend myself in a position that that, that had uh, that was relatively straightforward for a for a player to choose, 
I, 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 I find myself uh, j just at, at, at odds with all of this, you know, I really do, because as I said to you, the choice is the players and his alone. And even if, um, and I'm quite sure he's probably, he probably discussed it with the family. And if he was the one that wanted to play for England, he maybe have talked the, the, uh, his father around. His father definitely had um, had a viewpoint and a certainly a, and a liking for Declan to to play for to, to play for the Republic. But the choice is down to the player himself. And I'm quite sure that when England probably came in and said maybe didn't promise him the things that uh, that we could have done, like in, instant caps. But certainly England were not going to try and lose a player through just um, uh, through sheer laziness. Uh, of uh, letting a player like Declan Rice slip through their fingers. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I, I had to ask because it was the kind of number one thing that everyone wanted to hear. But you've answered it there. Um, just to finish it off there, because you've, you've, you know, been more than courteous with your time. So thank you for that. Just what would be your career highlight uh, if you're a player or manager? Or oh, I, I, I listen. Oh, I, I, you know what? Honestly, Paul, I, I mean it. When I started thinking about that question that's been asked before, I, I, uh, <clears throat> well. First of all, as a player at club level, I think that uh, I think that uh, to hoist that European Cup that night in Madrid in May of 1980 is just uh, you know it's a sublime moment uh, to to win the European Cup is sensational. You know some of the great players have not done it. Um, Roy Keane, you mentioned earlier, has made. Uh, I, I, had he been fit and had he been um, not suspended for the final, of course he would have participated and won it, and um, maybe I won it more readily than Manchester United did in 1999. However, so that's a great, great moment. Obviously, playing for Northern Ireland and, and beating Spain as as well. But moments about four or five years under Brian Clough were were unforgettable moments. League Cups, winning the championship. All of those particular things are really, really great. Things that you would only have dreamed about uh, when you were starting out in the game. Managerially, at club level, you know, uh, just uh, too many to mention. And at international level, obviously, the um, that um, uh, to me, the qualification the night against Bosnia, I think supersedes um, um, uh, the uh, the moment against Germany. Brilliant and all as that was, because there was a finality attached to the Bosnia game, and obviously uh, young Brady scoring that header at uh, and us beating Italy, it was just fantastic, really, really fantastic. So, no, I have, I know, I've been exceptionally lucky. I've played with a lot of great players. I've been involved with uh, uh, some really great teams, and I've been lucky enough to be uh, with um, with a, a mercurial manager like Brian Clough. And lots of other good managers besides, and I have uh, and I've been uh, been talented enough, I think, to take teams that um, that uh, on the face of it didn't look that strong, and uh, and get them to uh, get them to um, to competitions both at um, at uh, club level and international level. So uh, from that viewpoint, have I regrets? Absolutely. Did not winning the UEFA Cup, losing to Motherwell. In a day when we probably should have won the league at against uh, 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 Rangers, that would have been four out of five rather than three out of five uh, um, championships that we won. So uh, yeah, but um, uh, overall, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, uh, I should not complain. Absolutely, well, Martin, I just want to say a huge thanks for coming on, and you've given so much of your time to to have a chat and it's been a real pleasure to i suppose see see what you're kind of like away from from the media and the spotlight and stuff like that because you just kind of as you, you said before there's that friction so uh i just want to say a huge thanks uh and a privilege to to chat with you thanks so much the pleasure Paul. no problem uh, honestly and good luck with everything yourself thanks very much i'm sure we'll cross paths again until then take care and uh, god bless thanks very much good luck cheers paul Bye -bye. no problem the initiative about going in uh, for fifth and sixth year so i was phased into the training from from that summer and it was uh it was very tough at first you know going in at 15 years old